Okay. Hey, everybody. Hi. Jim and, Jim and Karina are a hard act to follow, but we will do our best to uh, play, play uh, you off the stage here today. Um, we're the last session before happy hour. We're the bridge to um, that time. So I'm pleased to be here with Dan. Um, he is one of the foremost critics of uh, workplace culture in Silicon Valley, but also a seeker <coughs> of a better way to run a company. He is the author most recently of Lab Rats, and we had a huge stack of these bright colored books uh, on the registration desk. They are all gone, but you can get a copy if you just sign a, our list on the way out and put your contact info. We will gladly send you a copy. Um, Dan is um, uh, the, also the author of Disrupted, My Adventure in the Misadventure in the Startup Bubble. Before that, he was a, a writer uh, for two seasons on the Emmy-winning show uh, Silicon Valley on HBO. He was an editor at Newsweek and also the creator of The Secret Life of Steve Jobs. So for someone who's been disrupted, you've been really busy, and that's plausible. <laughs> so welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you first about, like, um, how did we get here? You were covering s the tech world in the early days when we thought it was the answer to all our problems, and there was a kind of evangelical uh, feeling about it. What, was, what were we thinking? <laughs> what was it like? I, I, I think uh, it's hard to remember now, but in the 90s, yeah, we were really swept up in this um, euphoria about what the internet might do. And, and I wonder if it's, it's maybe human nature to imagine all the good things that you could do with, with a new uh, medium. So I remember when I was a kid, I'm not old enough that TV itself was a new medium, but in the early days of television, there's this idea, this is going to revolutionize education, we'll have a TV in every classroom, and mm -hmm. that's really not what TV turned out to, right? But um, I went back, when I was writing Lab Rats, I went back and did some clip searching, and one of my favorite always optimistic people is Kevin Kelly at Wired, who uh, loves everything. and, and in 1999, I think it was, he did this article about the roaring aughts. We were headed into an age of what he called ultra-prosperity. We were all going to have so much money, we wouldn't have to do with it. Oh, the, the, the subhead was, the good news is you're going to be a millionaire soon. The bad news is so is everyone else. Mm -hmm. And we were going to work fewer hours, have more money. We we're going to have all sorts of other people doing things for us. And, oh, democracy was going to be improved. We we're all going to be much better voters because we'd have all this information. Um, uh, and employees would be empowered. Work itself would be democratized. So uh, those were all the things that we expected. And then, then in the course of my book, it was like, well, what went wrong? Right? Mm -hmm. how, did, mm -hmm. how come we didn't get that? I, I still think that outcome was possible, would have been possible if not for a, a, a few things. Um, and maybe some version of it still is possible. And you were writing cover stories and things like that for Newsweek, and we were we were looking at these titans of technology. Right. But then you 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 have a very good ear, and you were starting to pick up something in the sort of the uh, voice of Steve Jobs, which was uh, I don't know if cult like is the word, but the reality distortion field that he was famous for doing. And you started a blog in his voice called the F Fake Steve Jobs, which became which was anonymous, so no one knew who you were, right. and there was great speculation, and how did, that, how did that unfold, and was it because you were starting to think, hmm? Um, I wish I could say that it was oh. that prescient, but, um, and as an aside, I would say that in the last few years when journalists or people have talked about, well, Trump just makes up his own reality and lives in it, I wanna, I wanna tell them, listen, I covered Apple, like we, we, we all knew that, we've all lived through this movie before, right? But that wasn't even it either. What it was was, this is a true but sad story. In the mid-2000s, I was at Forbes, and I was on the print side, and I could not get onto the dot-com side. Uh, power had shifted, where mm -hmm. internally at Forbes, mm -hmm. the print people were always the A team, and the dot-com were the B team. But I tried to get a transfer to dot-com because I was bored on the print side, and they said no. And that really scared me because I thought the print guys, A, now are powerful enough to turn people down internally, and they also think you don't get it. Like, you're too old, man. Like, no, this is a whole different world. And I thought, okay, pretty soon I'm going to get laid off. And when that happens, I better know how to do something 
online. I better know HTML. I better know how to write a blog I, so I can find a new job. So I literally just went out and started blogs on all the, the three big platforms. And I tried all sorts of different things. I had one about my kids. I had this and that. And then I had this idea that Robert Scoble had written a book called Naked Conversations about blogging. And, it, um, and the idea was, you're not going to need journalists anymore. You're just going to um, disintermediate that. And every CEO will have a blog. And you'll just talk directly to your customers. And I thought, having met a bunch of CEOs in Silicon Valley, that would be a really terrible idea. If you ever got an unvarnished look at the people that we covered, you'd be horrified, right? And then I started writing this. I had a, I had a Larry, uh, Larry, no, not Larry Page, uh, Sergey Brin blog. That wasn't very funny. And I just tried a bunch of them. And then I, I had one called Random VC, and it was supposed to be a venture capitalist anonymously blogging. That didn't work. And then Steve Jobs worked, you know, I had like a thousand people reading it after a few weeks, and I was like, oh, I didn't know you could count the number of people reading it. And then I was like, oh, I'll stick what around. The concept. Yes. And then it took off, and it, mostly because Steve Jobs himself had this cult following. And the gift was because he was so secretive and because he was so reclusive and he would never do anything, and Apple was so secretive in general, you could just fill in that void that they created with this voice. And um, it, yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. at the time it felt like you were getting exclusive interviews behind the scenes or you were some insider listening in on him. And I had so Apple that, people tell me that Jobs a few times had seen what I wrote that morning and said, I don't know who this writing this, but like this guy's like figured it out, you know. Oh. Like it was it was <laughs> often it was things you knew that Steve Jobs wished he could say, yeah. but he couldn't, you know. Oh. Like you whiny his the customers are the most whiny people in the world, you know. Um, but anyway. Right. So. And um, so then, um, and that turned into a book, and, um, mm -hmm. but then um, uh, the, the tech world, the social media things like that started eating, uh, you know, I was involved in, in, in mainstream media too, and it started eating up, uh, you know, eating our lunch. And um, at, that, at some point, out of the blue, you know, Newsweek was in trouble, and I think you, were, you were, got the layoff from them. And, yeah. w and what did you, um, we were talking about media about the globe before, but just before we move on to like Silicon Valley now, um, did mainstream media, what great mistakes did you see happen that, like, oh, did gosh, we bring it yeah. on ourselves? I think to some extent, yeah. But, but we also had, you know, it's a cl classic example of the, the innovator's dilemma where, you know, you're successful doing this thing and it's very hard to invent a new thing. Um, but toward the end of my time at Newsweek, uh, yeah, yeah, about halfway through there, I got an assignment to go write a story about the Huffington Post. It was uh, Kathy Devaney assigned it. Yeah. Right? So I went over and I, I interviewed Ariana Huffington, who is an overwhelming presence. It was crazy. I walked out of there just like, you know, yeah. oh, I'm in love with Ariana Huffington. She's amazing, like really, really in person. Like it was, it was really overwhelming. And very few people I've ever interviewed hit me that way. But also, I went around and talked to a lot of people, and I realized these guys are a tech company. They're not really. They're starting from the tech. They've yeah. got all these people, and they could look at comments. They could they could drive stories up based on where traffic was. They had all this back end stuff, and they had built their own CMS. Whereas at Newsweek, we were still running this. You remember the CMS that was patched together old, with a bunch tech, of different yeah. CMSs and duct tape and glue, and it was. Um, so, I realized then, like, yeah, that's the. That's the key thing is that they're really driven by tech. Whereas for us, it was just you know, throwing stuff over the wall to these people who try to get it online. Yeah. Um, also, I mean, I think at Forbes, we, Tim Forbes was struggling way before that in the mid-2000s, knowing that, gosh, you know, print might just go away. At the time, we all thought, well, uh, you know, print revenues might come down a little bit, but dot-com will come up and it'll be so big, it'll more than over uh, overcompensate. Yeah. And then we found out that, no, we were going to get pennies instead of dollars, you know. So, but Tim was trying things, and they just couldn't come up with anything. I think another thing they should do, and I think anybody in, a, in, a, in an industry targeted for disruption should just basically become a venture capital firm. Like what Forbes should have done is taken all that money we made in the first bubble when the magazine was yeah. this thick, and just literally you know, made it like Google Ventures. It's off to the side, you hire people, and you go just build media companies. They don't even have to be media yeah. companies. You could just, if you want to stay alive, that would just be, keep things, yeah. well, why didn't we start the Huffington Post, right? Why didn't we start the Daily Beast instead of having the Daily Beast um, buy us? Well, this is, this is what we gray-haired people sit and think about sometimes. But then you were, <laughs> there you were, gray-haired 
person uh, laid mm -hmm. off with, with a family, yeah. and, and you're thinking, well, wh why not f why fight them? Why not join them? And you take the plunge into a startup in Boston called HubSpot, and it was a sur became an immediately surreal environment, right? And later, and then the, hence the book. But what, what was that? What were the freakiest things that you encountered there? I, um, there probably people here from, from that company. So um, it was a terrific place. <laughs> I just was a bad fit. Um, but uh, that's what my book Disrupted is about. So yeah, I got laid off. And I got laid off in this ugly way. Just like Friday morning, got a call thinking, oh, we're talking about my new tech blog. And it was like, no, your job doesn't exist, which is also a line. I, I hate that line, like your job doesn't exist. I know the job exists. You're going to hire someone else. But, um, uh, but yeah, I was much older than everybody else. Everybody at the startup was, and I wasn't, I should have done more checking around about that. But I, I was 52, the average age was 26, and most people were right out of college, which was fine. I actually thought was cool, because it reminded me of a job I had in my 20s mm -hmm. when uh, computer magazines were just starting out. I went to work at a place called PC Week, and we were all young kids. We could yeah. do whatever we wanted. We, and I thought, this is great. These guys, I actually do believe that's where media is going to get reinvented, inside tech companies, even inside corporate uh, media departments. They have, they have resources, and they have innovation in a way that we don't. They're not, st I, I, I realized, inside Newsweek, I was one of the change agents. Like, I was one of the tech guys. In this world, I was, you know, the old guy who didn't get it. So I was there, like, learning from these people. It was, it was pretty amazing, right? But um, culturally, yeah, the age thing was a, a, a big problem. And there were other, other issues, I guess. But um, it, it turned out being funny in the, way, in the end. Like the, what, what well, I, we were fortunate that yeah. it was so weird that it was great material. And that, yeah. but, but, like, there was a, a, a scene in, in, in Disrupted. We'll get to the next book next. But... <clears throat> where you have this great idea, and you go to the two founders of the company, um, and they loved it, and they high-fived, and they said, let's do this thing, and then you went off on vacation and came back, and it was, they were nowhere in sight, and it was just kind of... Yeah, but you know, the funny way. thing is, so to me, like, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I'm stuck in this job that I hate. This is not what they hired me to do. I was hired by the two founders and I'm stuck down three levels down, and I can't get up out of this. I'm just going to go to them. I'm going to be a startup guy. I'm going to be entrepreneurial. I'm going to go up to the top and just make my job, you know, because I also had one of those jobs where it was like, well, the job's going to be whatever you make it, you know. It's like, well, I learned don't ever take that job, right? Like, and I say, it's just, I think this is a job that's going to be like whatever you make it into, like, oh. But so I went to them only to find out that politically I just committed suicide because now I've gone over the CMO's head and that was really stupid. So the funny thing is, like, in my, my world, like, if you had gone to John Meacham and Meacham said, absolutely, go start that thing for Newsweek, you could, you'd go back and that would be your, you'd throw that card on the table. Sorry, guys, Meacham, you know, would be like, oh, shit, you know. But every tech person I've told this story to just laughed at me, thinking, like, what were you thinking? Like, you're an idiot. Like, that was so stupid. Like, really, you didn't know that, that was going to blow up in your face? Like, it's very obvious to, I guess, normal people, but to journalists, it wasn't. So, um, yeah, that was one of <laughs> many mistakes I made. When this book came out in Polish, this disruptive came out in a lot of languages. This is a true story. Mm -hmm. um, they, a lot of places just translated disrupted, but they said, we want to change the title. Is that okay? I said, yeah, I don't care, you know? And they sent over a cover. And I swear to God, the title was F-A-K-A-P, FACAP. And I'm like, what's that, like a Polish word? They're like, no, you're a FACAP. You know, like, it's, it's like, wait a minute, this is your take on my book? Like, here people were like, that company must suck. The Poles were like, that guy sucks. That guy's an idiot, right? And, um, and they were right. Like, it was mostly stories of me really, really being stupid, trying to adjust to corporate life, like, and um, I've never worked again, frankly. So uh, <laughs> yeah, and then writing, that was one mistake. One mistake was doing it. The other mistake is then writing about how terrible you were as an employee, really well, not good for the career yeah. arc. Yeah. Great, it was yeah. a great fish out of water story, yeah. I suppose. So in, your, in the new book, um, Lab Rats, you went to look much more systematically, like what creates companies like this and their wacky management styles, and and 
you looked at many things about the business model and the culture. Maybe it's the business model to start with that, that you know, the incredible amount of VC money pouring in is, was one thing. Yeah, it's yeah. I, I, and distorting. I can't, yeah, because I came out of it, honestly, I, I'm making jokes about it and it, it was funny, there's a lot funny about it, but um, I also left this job with really, really like my self-esteem in tatters, like it really, really messed with my head in a, in a really bad way. Like psychologically, it was really, really harmful and upsetting. And I also realized I was not the only one. Lots and lots of other people. I'd never worked in a place where people got fired so often, like all the time, and where they would then call from the car. Like my friends would call me and like, oh my God, or having panic attacks. Like it was a lot of just, I guess, psychological damage. And it wasn't like, you know, people getting their fingers cut off in a saw, you know, in, in, at work, but it was another kind of damage. And um, when the, my book came out, all these people wrote to me, and it turns out, it's, I'm, I got the impression, this is like an epidemic of this kind of thing. People wrote to me saying, like, I, you know, got, had a bad experience, and it stayed with me for years. Like, I, I've been at depression, I've gone to therapy, even after I got a new job, it stayed with me. Like, what, what, what happened to me back there? And it felt to me like, we sounded not like, they often use the word escape. I'm so glad I escaped that place. Um, but it sounded not like people who had had a bad job, but like people who had survived a cult, like had, a, an escape from a cult or a psychological experiment. And then it sort of hit me. The place where I was working was essentially had a good idea, which is that, okay, work has changed. You know, we have the internet now. We still work the way we did 100 years ago, and that no longer really works. And we need to throw out all those old ideas and start over for the, in this new world, um, which is, Good, I think. I think it's true. The problem is that nobody knows what does work. And so we're in this period, I think, of experimentation where companies are just really literally trying things. Like, let's do Agile. Let's have 300,000 people go through Agile training. And, and, and I don't know, does it work? No, it never has, but let's see if it works here. You know? and, and that's where the title Lab Rats came from. Because I realized you're signing up for a job and you think, at least if you're my age, the old transaction was, I work, you pay me. That's it, see you later, bye, you know, screw you. I don't have to do tequila shots, I don't have to do, you know, beer bags, I do that on weekends at home. But you think you're going in for that transaction, but really you're signing up for a massive experiment in organizational behavior, right? That's what's really happening here. And each company is different. You know, each one has a different experiment, and the doctors performing the experiments are often unqualified and don't know what they're doing. And the science that they're imposing, the ideas themselves, are invented by quacks. So we had a thing called disc training. I don't know if any of you, maybe you use disc training, you think it's great. Disc training was, in, it's, a, it's like a Myers-Briggs, right? You can be a D, an I, an S, or a C. It was invented like in the 20s or the 30s by the, the comic book artist who created Wonder Woman. I mean, disc training is lunacy, right? It is absolute bullshit. Um, and you're put through it and handed your results in this solemn way with this package, and then you talk about them. And, and of course, like being one of us, I made fun of this, which you also are not supposed to do. Couldn't to, help, couldn't in help front yourself. of the instructor. And, journalists. But yeah, journalists, a room full of journalists would have been laughing our asses off at this. We would have been just totally hosing that instructor all day. But anyway. There's all sorts of these ideas, or you have the, the, the manager who is, you know, not to be ageist, but let's say 24, and um, <laughs> is in their first job, but now they're a manager, and they read a book or half of a book about Agile, and they go like, you know, we, we're going to do Agile, just in our department. But then they also maybe heard about Lean, and they're like, lean well, gonna, up, I yeah. know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a corporate guru myself. I'm going to blend a little Lean and a little Agile and we're gonna have a hybrid, we're gonna have not a scrum or a Kanban, but we're gonna have a scrum band, right? But we're not gonna do all of Agile, we'll just do stand-up meetings, and, and it's just, you know, it's, it's out of control, right? Um, so this is what you sign up for. Right? And um, yeah, I came to believe that it is actually creating profound psychological distress in people. Um, not just because of that, but there are, I'll shut up now. But well, you, well, you yeah. actually broke it down in, in, from all the surveying you did for this book into kind of four factors that are making people at a time of high, high employment 
um, and a good economy for all this time, a lot of them really unhappy. And there was one was like too much money pouring in that wants its money back. You had another one which is about real change for change's sake, and a couple other things that, oh, yeah, that kind oh, yeah. of piled on. Stress know? and dehumanization. But the money yeah. factor was not just the, the uh, money piling into Silicon Valley. It's also that regular workers are getting, we've been cheated out of trillions of dollars. Oh, if you yeah. look back over decades, there's a billionaire who's done this great study of this, and you look at just wages as a percent of GDP. Right. Uh, they've, they've gone down seriously. So we have jobs that are far more stressful and we get paid less. Well, you know, and wonder why people are miserable. You know, it's like not rocket science to figure that out, right? So, um, but, but yeah, it's, uh, stress is a big part of it. Change is one. So for example, I, I did all this research on the, the, like the neuroscience of change. And it turns out, you know, change is really difficult for people. And, and it's been well known for a long time that people can change a little bit, but then they need to stop. And then they can change a little bit. But being exposed to constant change uh, raises your cortisol levels and it makes people crazy in all sorts of ways. So do open offices. Like they've done, they all know this. Like every company that doesn't open office and says it's for collaboration, not just so they can cram more people into a veal pan and save money on square footage, is lying. One of the guys who designs open offices for a living said to me, oh yeah, you yeah, know, that's all bullshit. It's, it's just square footage. It's, 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 but, and they've done studies that show like people, you know, their, their physical health problems arise immediately mm -hmm. in open offices. And dehumanization is fairly easy. I mean, being constantly surveilled, uh, being managed by machines, being hired by machines, fired by machines. Um, it, it isn't um, necessarily the best, uh, the best situation. I'll tell you one funny anecdote. Like, right to the end, my editor said, we should find, since we're calling it lab rats, we should find some kind of thing with rats. That'd be cool, you know, just see if there's, a, and I found one. <laughs> And it is amazing, but do you know how they make a rat depressed, right? And I'd never thought about this, but when they design antidepressants, new antidepressants, they can't test them on humans right away. They start with rats, right? But to do that, you have to get a rat and make it depressed so that you can give it the antidepressant and see if it gets, you know, undepressed. And then they thought, well, okay, how are we going to do that? And it's amazing. It's called um, Unpredictable Chronic Mild Stress Protocol. No, you're shaking your head, you know this. Yeah, and it's tiny changes in the rat's routine. You tilt the cage a little bit, or you change the cycle of light and dark, but just a little. You play predator sounds, but you know, they, you don't ever starve the rat, you don't, you don't rat threaten its life. But you don't tell the rat, this is coming, there's no memory. Right, so it's yeah. unpredictable. So yeah. the rat, and, and you can't let them get used to it. If they start, you know, you change the, 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 the sawdust and you put wet sawdust in. And you clean that out, you put some sawdust with another animal species in. You just do tiny things, and the rat goes nuts. Like within two weeks, the rats are like lethargic, they won't get on their wheel, they won't eat, or they get fat, they stop grooming, their coat gets, it's just like they're, you look in and it's a depressed rat, right? Um, and I thought, I had just read this book by the woman who ran HR at Netflix called Powerful. And it was all about how to screw your employees, right? And I thought, this is exactly what she describes as a human version of, of unpredictable chronic mild stress protocol. It's exactly it. And only Netflix is like, a lot of people want to know how we do things at Netflix. We're so cool. I was like, no, 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 no. I don't, I don't want to copy Netflix. But um, so, yeah, it's. Um, this is the team, not a family people, the Netflix. Exactly. Folks. They're yeah. the ones who had yeah. the, the, uh, the, the slogan. Yeah, what do they call it? Uh, culture deck. Yeah. We're a team, not a family, which just means don't get too comfortable, yeah. right? Like you're probably going to get fired. And then the other one they say, and this is like people working in call centers at Netflix, right? You know, it's not like pro baseball players. You know, they're like, we're, uh, the other one they say, you know, we're like a pro sports team where we need the best at everything. And like, you know, you might be good for now, but if a better shortstop comes along, you're out. And it's like, these people work in call centers, right? Or the, another one I have is, yeah, you probably get fired here, but you know, there's no shame getting cut from the Olympic team. And I thought, these people are like so getting high on the smell of their own farts at Netflix. Like, I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, it's Netflix, right? I mean, it's okay. I like the movies, you know, but like you're Netflix, you know, it's like, get over yourselves. You guys really think you're Olympic athletes of the corporate world, you know, all of you, you know? Then I looked up their glass door rating, and it's the same as Dow Chemical. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and 
And my editor made me take out that like, what a bad day at Dow Chemical and consists of is like the plant blows up and you're yeah. set on fire and it's like, <laughs> and Netflix is right there. Right there. Right there. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> we, had, we had to cut that though. I don't know if it was because sensitivity at Dow or Netflix. I also took a lot of shots at Amazon, which I realized, oh, that's right, Amazon sell sells books. books. Yeah, yeah. That was not yeah. a smart move. So I'm two for two. First I did the one with the old employer, then I did the one like saying how awful Jeff Bezos is. You know, like, yeah, you have to find next, another way. Yeah, what, like to find the Roman another, Catholic Church. You have to find another way to get that, to mm. get the word out about Amazon. But at any rate, um, yeah. So, but um, okay, well, mostly when you talk about that, so we've been talking about the tech world, Silicon Valley, but not, but beyond Silicon Valley, is the larger, mm. you know. But surely that can't happen to established companies like Ford or something, right? I'm, this is a setup because you go and visit Surely Ford. Surely not. So, yeah. so it, nope. it, it, this sensibility you think is kind of contagious in the corporate world and we should be vigilant? And well, I think it's seeping up. Like I think uh, it's an interesting thing to me that Silicon Valley, when I started covering it in the 80s and the early 90s, it was actually, I think it was a fun place to work then. But also, they didn't consider themselves thought leaders in how to manage people. I mean, maybe HP maybe, right? But they were... They were just selling products. And at some point, they also came to decide that the other thing we export is ideas on how to manage people. And we've really got it figured out, yeah. right? And you should listen to us. You should copy us, because we really know what we're doing here. And um, so Reed Hoffman, who founded LinkedIn, writes all these books about management. He's a public intellectual now, right? He considers himself right. that. Um, so um, they are actively touting themselves to other industries as a model. And I think other industries are terrified of being disrupted by Silicon Valley. And so the natural response is, well, let's go find out what they do and we'll copy them. We'll disrupt ourselves. Um, so yeah, I, I ended up, I visited Ford while I was working on Lab Rats and they were having a hackathon, only they had to do it like, you know, the way a 300,000 person company would do it, which was like, it was all scripted and it wasn't really real and it was like staged and it was like, oh, the whole audience. And they had all of us journalists there to watch it, which is also not what you do at a hackathon. Right? So it was like, it was like, see, we're hip. We're like, we're like Tesla, you know? They had their Michigan accents and like, you know, we had to go for a ride in the self-driving car that wasn't really a self-driving car. They had, you know, engineers like, oh, <laughs> driving the wheel. So, um, but it was, you know, and I thought, oh yeah, this is, or they'll do these things called silicon safaris. Companies will send six people, eight people out for a week and you visit a bunch of startups. There are actually now tour guides who have created entire businesses designed just to, to do silicon safaris. And people make money schlepping you around mm -hmm. and they get a lot of big companies uh, to, who are like, whatever, you know, SAP will be like, yeah, you can come through and visit our center and we'll give you a tour and whatever. Maybe we'll sell something. And I, I had dinner one night with a bunch of German businessmen who, had, who all were like, you know, from real companies that made real stuff that turned a profit. And it was like the week that Uber was really imploding and uh, they had had a whole week of visiting these guys. And I thought, what on earth did you possibly learn from these nitwits? And they were like, well, we saw some nice satellites at one place. I was like, okay, fine. But, but yeah, so there's this people either, or they'll go out and set up an incubator, right? So they're yeah. all trying to copy, try to get that mojo of, of Silicon Valley. There was a guy out there, metaphorically, this just works so well, I should tell you this. Um, at the same time this was all going, there was this young guy who went to med school at Stanford but never practiced medicine and he created a company called Ambrosia, and they mm -hmm. would do um, blood transfusions of teenage boy blood. Okay. You could get a quart of teenage boy blood for like 8,000 bucks. And, it would and he was claiming not only could it stop the aging process, he believed it could reverse the aging process. And I said, so wait a minute, you're telling me like I could go from like 80 to 30? He's like, yeah, if you got enough blood, you know, you could do this. And I'm like, that's clearly not true, right? But, yeah. um, and, and I really wanted to get some magazine pay for this. I wanted to go do a freelance article, like, give me a shot of the, I'll take a quart, <laughs> top me up, see what happens. And first he said it's like the first month you feel like a rock star, because it's like teenage boy, you get all this testosterone, you just like, Arr! and then over about six months it fades, and you're back to you, you know? And, uh, and he told me he had a 92-year-old guy who was coming in once a month, paying eight grand, maybe even 16 to get two quarts, I don't know. And I thought, what? 
what are you possibly thinking, you 92-year-old man? Like, you still look 92 on the outside. I don't care how you feel on the inside, you know? But then I realized it's the metaphor for, like, what Ford is doing. Like, Ford is 100 years old, but they're like, give us that teenage boy blood. Like, just like, yeah. you know, we'll set up an incubator, we'll put 50 people there, and then let them come back and, like, course around through our bloodstream and change our DNA, you know? Um, and I don't think it works, but it makes everybody feel good. It makes them feel like they're doing something. Yeah, yeah so, you know. Well, well, with all this and I never got the boy blood because no one would pay for it, and I'm not paying eight grand for that experience. With the boy you know? blood, then the, the yeah, my you wife could, was like, could, hell uh, no. You could <laughs> have your own blood spun in a blender and put back in your knee and things like that. That's a thing well, now. Yeah, that's a thing. Because yeah. that's where the show got the idea for having. I think Gavin Belson was hooked up to Blood Boy, and they had this Blood Boy where they wheel in Blood Boy and they'd sit there and get the blood. But it's not. You don't do it directly with Blood Boy next to you. Kids go in and donate blood. But I'm uh, sorry. So, oh, uh, oh. so. I, you know what? I don't know. The question is, how much were the boys paid for their quart of blood? <laughs> Probably nothing, right? Like it's Silicon Valley, so I'm sure Dan, it was like Dan, it was like Uber drivers. You're, you know, you're they on, they got like you're on, a dollar and a half or something, right? You're on such a roll here that I, I, I skip right past the part where we try to say something positive and, and inspiring. <laughs> oh yeah, because the this is my gift: yes. being relentlessly negative. <laughs> I get. I get I had a book review once of one of my no uh, fic piece of fiction saying, this book is unrelentingly depressing. And I was like, yes, <laughs> that's true. I did it. I'm it's Irish. The yeah, pure thing. Yeah. 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 But, <laughs> but there was something that was, I, I hate to do a spoiler alert, but at the very end <coughs> of this book, there's a particular factor and, um, yeah. that was found by, some, uh, is it Dan Ariely? Or, or yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's one thing that makes people feel good about the work that's kind of like the boy blood, or it's the antidote to a lot of the you know, crazy stuff out there. And it, um, do you want to just Yeah, Ariely has started this hedge fund. And what the idea was is let's go study, uh, the company is called Great Place to Work. They do the Fortune yeah. Best Place to Work list every year. And I interviewed them too about various aspects of, you know, there are companies that have been on that list every year for 20 years. And I tried to reverse engineer them. What do they all have in common in their DNA? Um, ping pong, beer pong, not on the list. But, um, and then Ariely had this idea, God, you guys have been doing this survey for 20 years, right? What if you sifted through all of that data and then you tried to correlate, make a list of companies that have outperformed the stock market over the course of those 20 years and correlate the employee survey data with stock market performance and then find one or two things, and then you could use that as a predictive mechanism to predict st stock market winners in the future. And the one word that they found over and over was safe or safety. Mm -hmm. People felt safe. And it meant either physically safe, like you're not gonna get an OSHA violation, but also more like psychologically safe. Mm -hmm. And um, as part of that too was a sense of welcome. They saw that phrase show up a lot. And, and it, it seems really, really obvious, but actually that was um, correlated with performance of the stock, not just with happiness. But uh, yeah, it was a very interesting thing. And in, in the end of the book, I wrote about a, a lot of companies that are, I think are, they've seen the same thing, and they're trying to um, address it. So workaholism in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley is a crazy, and this whole culture of hustle and grind, you know, and like driving people to suicide, driving people into emotional collapse in order to get their options or to st keep their jobs. Um, there's one word I've interviewed a, a couple different tech CEOs just recently. I kept hearing this word agency. And the idea was we're not, we don't give out tasks, we assign problems. We, let, we tell someone, this is the problem, can you help us figure it out and solve it? So it's not just like, we need you to make this, okay? Go make that, all right, bye. You know, um, so this word agency I don't know, it, it stuck in my head that yeah. like, oh, the idea is to make people feel that they matter, that they're, what they're doing, that they have some freedom in deciding. Advocate, advocate on their own behalf and And, and, take, and also you figure action. out how it yeah. works. We're not gonna tell you, how, and, and yeah. whatever you figure out, as long as it's within certain parameters, that's, that's okay, yeah. Well, I find that uplifting, and mm. see, you can do it um, if you try. And <laughs> it was very positive, and thank you. Um, uh, yes. Um, it's, the book is Lab Rats and uh, mm -hmm. it has a happy ending and a lot of inspiring stuff <laughs> <Yeah>. after <laughs> the death. <laughs> so. yeah. right, thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Thanks, yeah.